Hi, everyone. This is Ron from pocculture.com. I am here with the man with the most amazing hair I've ever seen, Chavi de Guzman from Made. How are you, Chavi? Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for having me. <laughs> nice to have you, too. I appreciate the time. So we were talking about this before we started recording. You're on an epic road trip, right? What's the where, where are you visiting and what was the impetus behind taking the trip? Um, so started in Vancouver, um, went east, currently in Toronto, so from Vancouver, um, went through Alberta, um, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and then into Ontario, where Toronto is located, currently in Toronto, getting the truck serviced to continue the road trip on to the Maritimes, so heading to Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and then fingers crossed that the borders open because then we can continue the road trip, but then head down, cross the border into Maine and drive down south to Florida and hopefully be able to take Route 66 over to California and then California back up to Vancouver. That is amazing. Um, how long is it, is it going to be from beginning to end, do you think? Um, it's kind of up in the air. Um, like one big, I guess, because you're you're asking like what started it. Well, um, I've always wanted to do this as a kid to convert something into kind of like a mobile home situation, and then um, COVID hit and ruined all travel plans. <laughs> so, but then at the time, land borders were open, so it was convenient to make it. And then all of a sudden, they closed land borders, so it kind of just left me. Um, the opportunity to explore Canada, which is cool because not a lot of Canadians especially undertake that. And then I read Matthew McConaughey's book where he talked about um, doing the camper thing for a minute. So that kind of pushed it. And then I was in a relationship and then it kind of went weird. And then <laughs> it was like, okay, <laughs> cool. Well, I can't find love anymore. So I'm just going to undertake this. And then we ended up getting back together. And so we're doing the road trip together now. <laughs> wow, Chavi, yeah. this is the makings of a documentary film or like a scripted film based on the journey. I feel like, I hope you're, you know, taking okay. some good footage. <laughs> oh, 100%, like by the end of it, it's gonna be either a happy ending rom-com or it's gonna be like uh, Julia Roberts and, um, what was that? My girl? Is it? No, not my girl. Uh, are you talking about my best friend's my, wedding? My best friend's wedding. Yeah. Or <laughs> that was like the first <laughs> one where I was like, oh, wow, these rom coms don't always have a happy <laughs> So we hey, will see where this leads. One way or the other, no matter what for you, I'm, we're going to manifest a happy ending. What, whatever it happens, it's got to be positive um, because <laughs> you deserve it. But that's that's awesome. Now, you. you talked about everything that with the pandemic and all that, I feel like a lot of people have been inspired to do the thing they've always wanted to do in their life, but they hadn't done because of the pandemic. Was that any kind of inspiration for you to like finally get this going? Um, a little bit, for sure. Um, but it was kind of forced into that because like I, I love traveling already, um, even before I started acting. So this opportunity to travel a different way was definitely suggestive of the fact that traveling became limited during COVID. So it was a big reason as, as well as it forced the acting industry to become self tapes. So a part of the reason why I loved Vancouver for the industry was because of the opportunities that came to Vancouver. But then now that it's all remote and I can self-tape it from anywhere, I felt like I didn't have to lock myself to the city. That's really cool. And I have definitely been hearing that echoed by some of the other folks that I've talked to who are doing a lot of self-taping. How has that experience been for you adjusting to being an actor during the pandemic? you know, doing a lot of self tapes. Are you enjoying that? Uh, what, what has been like the pluses and minuses? Uh, I, I miss the room. I miss the room. Um, I think the biggest reason why I miss the room is because I felt like I had an edge because everybody else said they hated the room. 
So it's like, okay, if I'm the only person that likes the room, then I guess that gives me some kind of freedom in a place that everybody else is dreading. So I miss, I do miss the room. It, it, there's, cause especially getting to meet the producer or director ahead of time. Um, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have been in the room with director producer and then I didn't book the role, but because they liked me, they, they put me in on the next episode with a bigger role, right? So it's like, I do think there's a benefit to showing face to people that you've never met before. Whereas everything being online, I love it. Um, it still feels the same way in terms of putting a tape down and making strong choices, but you, it misses that that personal connection with these people that you do want to work with. Yeah, I can totally get that. And of course, you're so memorable in the room, right? You walk in, then everyone's going to remember you. And I can see where that edge comes from. So there was, uh, there's, I, there's one time where, um, again, like I don't, I don't, it's hard for actors to get feedback. And I remember there was one time it was an industry event and I was there with my manager and one of the casting directors came up and like she complimented the choices that I made. And it definitely made a lasting impact because I, from that point, I could only hope that I'm making choices that stand out. So then to hear that in person, it was very reaffirming of, you know, the work that I'm bringing to the table. Yeah, I like that. It, especially because it can be such a negative experience sometimes feedback um oh, yeah. but to get some of that positive that must have been really affirming what's oh, been yeah. what was like one of your favorite if you can share one of your favorite like room experiences that really stuck out to you um positive um, or negative <laughs> there's there's this one where and every like it's funny to hear other actors stories about it but and they always talk about the the time that they didn't think they were going to get it and there was one role that was for a show called Baroness Von Sketch, a sketch comedy show. And they were looking for a stripper. And so I'm like, all right, cool. They're, it's, it's a fun show. They're looking for a stripper. All right, I'll, whatever, let's give it a shot. And then I, I go into the room uh, to, and it's the waiting room. And like, I'm surrounded by like these Chippendale guys. And I'm like, okay like <laughs> this is I, I don't okay um I guess I'm just here for fun and I'll send my <laughs> agent a message saying like I hate you for sending me to this <laughs> but then and then I I was on deck and then the person that walked out of the room maybe that was also a reason why I started growing my hair I don't know but he walked out of the room this six foot tall guy broad shoulders hair down to his back and then he kind of just looked at me and like in the most genuine way like gave me the wink in the gun and was like you got this bro <laughs> and then just walked out in the coolest way and I was just sitting there just like no you got it like <laughs> you, you definitely got it and then went in made my choices and casting like they liked it they were there was something about it that like stood out to them. I didn't get it at the time because I'm like, okay, clearly you you want one of the guys that was in the waiting room. And then I ended up booking it, which was really hilarious. And yeah, but that was like my favorite in-room moment um, or the most memorable one. I have, I have a couple other ones as well. I love it. That is an amazing story. Um, and it's so funny, like this guy le left such an impact on you, right? And then yeah. like, kind of gave you that maybe that extra boost that you needed going into the room that's pretty awesome and it's like it's it's unfortunate that I don't like if if this happened today I'd have like the the knowledge at least to like look at the call sheet it's like oh what was this guy's name I don't even know the guy's name I don't <laughs> I haven't seen his work I don't and I wish I have because like yeah he has something that stood out to me that it's like okay this guy's built for this industry I hope he's doing well <laughs> I love that. It just shows the crazy ways just strangers can leave lasting impacts on, you know, on each other's lives. That's that's oh, such an amazing story. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about your current project. You're on Netflix's Made, which, you know, is such a cool show. And 
you play kind of a controversial character. <laughs> you're, you're not a bad guy or anything, but obviously, uh, given the nature of the story, um, tell me a little bit about how you got involved with the show and what you really like about your character. Um, how I got involved with the show, it was one of the first, no, one of the first, if not the first audition back from when the whole industry shut down. So, and it was one of the first big budget things to start filming um, after the first wave of COVID. So that audition was one of the ones where it was like, all right, cool. I, I get to shake off the rust um, going, getting back into this industry. So it's like, I, I didn't try to put too much stress on this thinking like, oh, I got to book this because it's the first one back. Um, I, I took it very lightly in that I treated it as somebody else is going to get it, but it's a great way to get my feet wet again. Um, and so getting that call was, I already forgot about it. Um, it was one of those ones where it's like, all right, the audition's done. I get to let it go, move on with my life, wait for other auditions. And then a month later, I get a call saying that they were interested in me. And just the whole process of dealing with COVID and I don't know, there was needing to do COVID tests all the time and all that stuff for pre-production was also interesting where it's like, I'm already doing so much work before I even get to set. Um, so that was also um, a part that I'll definitely remember where you had to get it done and if you didn't get it done there was going to be somebody on set ready to yell at you <laughs> it's like you, did, you didn't get this done go to go to this trailer and get it done and don't let it happen again okay i'll try um and as for my character um as as they tell you in acting school like acting 101 like don't judge the character um could my character have been more sympathetic towards Alex's situation 100% <laughs> but um I think these characters are real life people that make these situations hard so it was an important character to help build the story around domestic violence so I was I was thrilled to be able to lend that aspect to this piece. That's great. Now, was you talked about the production, especially just after the pandemic kind of started allowing things to open up a little bit. And so what was it like just with the cast of, and crew as a whole in terms of being a part of this? Was there a particular excitement in finally getting to do something like this after the pandemic? And is there anyone that you were really close to in the cast? Um. I got really close to um, the one in my cast, uh, Christy, where because we're from the same city and we also had to commute, take the same ferry sometimes, um, it definitely gave us an opportunity to just, I guess, let out all of our, what's the word, um, angst about it being our first production back as well as Raymond de Black, uh, another um, Toronto actor who I grew up around watching. So that was also exciting getting to really connect with him because in regards to the conversation of diversity and the importance of diversity, he was like one of the OGs in terms of Canadian diversity and leaving his mark on Degrassi. So that was definitely, um, uh, a refreshing moment to re-enter the industry and then re-enter the industry with people that I'm familiar with. Um, and it was just, it was the water, the water cooler chat is, was typically always the same where it was just a relief to get this normalis normalcy of what we were used to. And being able to depict life without masks 
was also something that like we were excited to do because everything was masked. And then I, I remember watching This Is Us um, when that came out and then they touched on the pandemic and them needing to wear masks too. And it's like, it's, it's different now where normal is masked and it kind of lends... I guess not a make believe aspect to what we do, but it it kind of helps us in terms of letting us know we're telling a story. So it's like as real as we're trying to make it, there's that separation of, okay, this is this was a time when masks weren't a thing. And then real life is masks. So it's it's yeah, it was it was it's it's interesting. Yeah, remember that? Remember the time when <laughs> <laughs> No, you, you're right. You're talking my language. You talked about the diversity and how important that is, uh, especially for, you know, the Filipino community and just Southeast Asians in general. I think there's definitely this, um, you know, feeling that there's de even as we're getting more Asian representation in, in Western media, you know, Filipinos and Southeast Asians are definitely not getting their due, you know. So what does it mean to you to be uh, representing that community on screen, how important is it for you to inspire that community? Um, the importance to inspire them is definitely high on my list. Um, and the pressure of it is also <laughs> high in regards, but I try not to let it, I guess, burden my shoulders in a way. I understand the importance of it, but with respect to that, um I gotta give a shout out to like the directors and the writers where I don't feel as an actor being on screen and being the face that people see it's amazing but then I want to take this opportunity to push now in the direction of your writers of colors and your directors of colors because unfortunately when I booked this role I booked it I beat out other people of color and then it took away their opportunity to shine. Whereas your directors and your writers, they're the ones that are writing in people of color. So when you see me on screen, I'm only one person. Whereas the writer gave an opportunity to 10 people. The director gave an opportunity to cast, you know, 10 people. So it's like, I just want to put light on where the light should be shot. It's like, don't, don't look at me. I'm on screen. I get it. But the real heroes of diversity and pushing this agenda is the writers and the directors. That's pretty awesome. And very overly humble of you to say, because <laughs> let me tell you, we're all looking at you and we, and we want to look at you and cheer you on. But at the same time, you're right. We, we all need each other. And I, I'm glad that you highlight that because we need more diversity behind the camera. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like you said, in the writer's room and the director's chair. So uh, I definitely hope that we can continue to push that. So, from your experience, you're a child of immigrant parents. How have they experienced your, you know, um, transition into acting? And now you're on a Netflix show. What's that been like for them? Exciting, um, because it's it's not something that every immigrant family can share or express, even to degrees of separation where being seen on TV was literally a foreign dream. Um, even shows and stuff that were airing and, and on, in theaters in the Philippines were American shows. And it's like, it's, it's not our people that are on that screen that people are idolizing and, and gawking at and like wanting to emulate. So I, I definitely, feel the excitement through them when they tell me that they're sharing the news with another family member or something or a cousin or aunt is reaching out saying how proud they are and and I'm I'm definitely thrilled that my parents get to be part of that experience for sure I love that that's so awesome all right well uh last question for you before we get out of here I asked this to as many of the Asian folks that I interview as I can where can we find the best Filipino food in Vancouver? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, for the best Filipino food, there is a fun restaurant called Culinaria. Um, and the neat part about that is, especially when it comes to Filipino dining, um, eating with your hands is definitely something that's important. And it's called Kamayan. And even knowing how to eat with your hands. And this restaurant does a great, I, I don't know how it's doing because of COVID, um, but I got the opportunity to experience it where I got my friends and they just laid down banana leaves on the table and it's, it's, it's all, it's communal and it's a different bonding experience. So culinaria for sure. Um, also definitely got a shout out Shameless Buns food truck. Um, they're kind of doing a Filipino fusion type menu and it's on wheels. So it's like you get to follow them around and follow them on, on Instagram and, and see the different things that they're creating. Um, so Culinaria, Shameless Buns, and oh man, I, I can't remember the name that my friend took me, but oh, that's, <laughs> I just dropped me. it on you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's going to bother me now. Oh man, because I wish I could shout them out right now, but it's a restaurant in Richmond and it's next to an IHOP. <laughs> that's all I can <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you think about it, I'll put it in the in the notes and and in the post when I publish it, so that people can check it out, um, so that good. they can get some love too. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, Chavi. Well, thank you so much. You know, I, I enjoy made and enjoy your performance, and wishing you the best. Looking forward to following what you've got next. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Take care.